when I tell people that I haven't had a cookie or chocolate bar or any kind of junk food in over five years, most people compliment me on my tremendous discipline. And considering that I just came back on from vacation, most people expect that I would have had some kind of dessert with every meal. Again, didn't do that. And I want to point out today why it's not discipline that allows me to do this. And I think that the false idea that it takes discipline to eat well comes from the idea that, well, you know, school and work take discipline. So one of the things that I want to point out today is that when we're trying to engage our life and do all the things that we're supposed to do for our healthy lifestyle, sometimes we let other people's ideas about what's true impact what we're going to do. And I shouldn't say sometimes, I think we always do that. But the problem is if we don't realize that those things are coming from bad places, then we get pulled down a rabbit hole of bad behavior. <clears throat> so <laughs> first let's define discipline. Discipline is the practice of training people to obey rules or code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I want you to think about is that when it comes to school, kids learn through playing, right? So adults put kids in school, first and foremost, most of us, because we need to go to work. And if our kids are not in school being taken care of, we can't go to work. Now, we also put kids in school to learn to socialize. And we put kids in school to educate them, you know, towards a career of some kind, because we want our kids to do well in life. And so teaching them from an early age, you know, getting them on that path of learning from an early age is beneficial to our kids. Now, since kids learn through play, um, the, the thing that we need to keep in mind is that when they're out in their environment, for example, exploring, and one of the things my daughter loved to do was to just be out in the yard finding bugs and climbing trees and, you know, just exploring her environment. If we were in the house, she was always, that, that kid could tell me if I moved a plant or a picture she was always paying attention to everything around her and like nothing got past her. So kids are always trying to understand their world. And so they're, they're engaging with it and, and paying attention. Babies understand their worlds by putting things in their mouths. You know, toddlers, they'll wander further and further away from their parents. And the older our children get, the more questions they ask and the more they explore their world. One of the things I remember is my brother <laughs> had to put a cap, a limit on the number of questions his daughter could ask him in a row because she would just keep going and going and trying to get deeper and deeper and more information. And, more. and honestly, like, I think she always wanted more information. She was that curious. So when we think about how our kids learn, we need to be able to see all the different places that they're going to be engaging in their, like praying pretend, right? It helps children to engage, to learn about the emotional and the social interactions they're going to have in life, which then helps them to take on personas that they see in their world and then emulate them, right? So they want to pretend to be parents. They want to pretend to be puppies, right? Kids learn about their worlds and how they fit into it by pretending and doing actions, some of the actions that we, as parents, we don't understand. Even though when we were their age, we did all of these things. And they like to copy. They copy each other, and they copy us. It's called vicarious learning. And we try to think that our kids will do what we tell them. That's not reality. Our kids do what we do. And they do it at extremely young ages. I remember Kyler being less than three years old. That's my daughter, less than three years old. 
and I came to her room and found her watching a DVD. And so she had turned the television on and she had put the DVD in and turned and turned it on just from watching me do it a bunch of times. Like our kids are so smart and our kids are always learning, but yet somehow we have this belief that they don't want to learn, right? That, that, that we have to force them to do these things. And we don't realize that kids are always trying to challenge themselves and do things in ways that are not typical. They experiment with things, right? Will this paper boat float on the water? Right? They, they want to learn. They want to figure things out. So they challenge their bodies. They challenge ideas and concepts that we might put in front of them. They challenge what seems to be, in our opinion, common sense. But if you actually pay attention and listen to your children, what we realize is that there's a line of logic there that does make sense. By the time that we reach the work world, all of the curiosity and the, the challenge has been pretty much like it's been schooled out of us, most of us, right? Like most adults remember hating school. I talk to lots of my friends and they, they don't want to know anything about learning anymore. Is their experience of school was being forced to do stuff. And since we hate school and school is linked to learning, then now we think we hate learning. But remember, kids go around learning as their entertainment. And if you really think about it, when you allow yourself to engage a new type of entertainment, there's a learning that's involved. If you want to play an instrument, you need to learn to do that. If you want to go hiking, you need to learn about roots and safety and all these things about hiking. When we take up new hobbies and activity, we're in learning mode. So we avoid learning new things and working because we don't want, like away from work, we don't want to be learning. We don't want to be working. And this is something that we were taught in our social structure. It's not natural. I know for myself, and there's a lot of people that I talk to, that when you really ask them what was the last thing that they did was amazing fun, it was attached to a new activity or something that they did where they had to learn how to do that thing. So, you know, exercising after a long day in the office, it feels like work. So we avoid it. And we don't need to learn how to exercise today because we learned how to do that at some point in our upbringing. And so therefore to exercise after work, we use discipline to achieve that process because it's not fun for most of us. We're exhausted at the end of the day. And if I don't exercise, well, I'm going to get fat or I'm going to, I'm going to have health issues. My body's not going to feel good. I'm going to be weak. I'm going to be maybe not shaped the way I want to be shaped. So there's all these punishments that go along with not exercising because I don't want those things. So therefore I need discipline to get me to do it. Without discipline, I won't eat correctly. And I need it to follow the rules, right? So this is about a code of behavior. Does eating healthy need to be a rule? Do I need to put these, these things in front of me that force me to eat healthy? Well, I want to point something out to you. The more options that we have, the more rules we actually need. So since we have cookies and cakes and garbage that we call food, then we need to make rules about eating to get people to eat the meats with the healthy fats and the low glycemic vegetables that they actually should be eating. That is what is actually food. We call process 
garbage food, and then we get confused when it's time to eat. And while this I want you to think about the fact that that is a relatively new story for us. Because go back 100, 200 years, we didn't have processed garbage on our plates all the time, or in our, I can't even say on our plates, because they come in packages, crinkly sounding packages that we open and we don't even need to put them in the plate. And they're causing our poor health. But we we call this stuff food. And it's not, in my opinion. It's not. So, but we're going to get to that. So, you know, growing up, um, my grandmother used to constantly tell me that I'm too smart for my own good. And she normally would tell me that when I was starting up a conversation, typically with my parents, where I was about to launch into something that she could see from a mile away was going to get me in trouble because I was about to oppose something my parents were telling me to do. And even though she would tell me later that, yeah, your logic makes sense, but at the same time, they're in a rush. They're trying to get something accomplished. And and I, yeah, I was too smart for my own good. And I think that when it comes to engineered food, we've engineered food to the point that it isn't good quality anymore. And I think, honestly, we were just too damn smart for our own good. And now we have all this product that they want us to eat that brings a lot of money very cheaply to companies, but brings very little quality to the bodies we're trying to build. And so we need to force ourselves to eat the healthy food that would actually give us the quality bodies that we're trying. So we need discipline to force us to do the right thing, or we would just keep eating the garbage. And we think that it's hard to eat the healthy food because, well, it doesn't taste as good as the garbage. I'm going to argue with that one because I don't think that's true, but... For a lot of people, the taste of the garbage, all the sweet flavors that are there are being qualified as better tasting than healthy vegetables. Can I point out, Wellness Warrior, that the healthy vegetables that we are even eating don't taste how they used to taste 500 years ago because... First of all, there's soil changes that have happened, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the engineering that's gone into making apples bigger and sweeter, carrots and tomatoes bigger and sweeter, all the vegetables and fruits that we love to eat, strawberries that are bigger and sweeter. Why is sweeter and bigger always the thing that's coming up? So, well, it's because that's what gets us to eat more of it. If you need to force yourself to do something, you will try to get around it. And having to force myself to eat healthy foods means that I'm constantly trying to get around it. So, are all the rules really that hard to follow? Are all rules hard to follow? Let's think about some of the things that we do on a regular basis and how hard are they for us to do? Like, for example, going to bed. We go to bed every single day. It's not difficult. When I get tired, I go to bed. Uh, Having a game night or seeing friends or going to my, or watching my favorite show. Again, not hard when it's the time. So when I know my favorite creator is putting up on a certain day around a certain time, I check my phone to find that person. Or when I know that I have an invitation to go see my friends, I get out there and I go see my friends. I'm really good at doing these things, right? When my favorite show on television is coming on, when I when I used to watch television, I knew exactly what time to be sitting down to watch Cosby show or, you know... um, I I can't even remember. I haven't watched television in so long. But the point being is that I used to sit and watch these things and I I did it without any trouble. Taking a shower, brushing my teeth, um, you know, all that grooming. I I do it every single day. As a matter of fact, going to work. I happen to be one of those people that nobody needs to force me to go to work. I just go, right? No problem for me. Greeting people when I see you. If you walk up to me, I say hello. No, no issue. 
I just, I just say, hello. Hi, how are you doing? And most people do it back to me. Is It's weird if we don't do these things. And they can actually cause friction in our day if we don't do them. Right? The people that we interact with will react weirdly to Can you imagine if I didn't wash for like weeks and then I went to work? Like it would cause friction. And so this is this interesting, right? Because there is a negative that would happen, but that's not why I do it. I do it because when I take a shower, I feel great. When I brush my teeth, I love the taste of that. I love the taste of the toothpaste. And my mouth takes it. Like there are th- I, I like saying hello to people because then they say hello back and then we end up in a conversation or a great inter- So do I need to have a negative? And by the way, just to point this out to you, these routines that I'm talking about, they're codes of behavior <laughs> that we live by that we're not forced to do. We just do them because they actually feel good. They actually feel good. What if I, what if I love to eat what I eat? What if I love feeling good? What if I know that eating those foods that I love allows me to keep feeling good? Like, what if that's the reason that I'm choosing to eat the way that I eat? Would that mean that eventually I would just do it more often and do it more often and do it more, and it would just be natural and easy and not require tremendous discipline to do? Am I punishing myself to do? No, not at all. Am I forcing myself to? No, not at all. When I went on vacation, There was the question, what will I eat? And it was easy for me. I will eat on plan. Why? Well, first of all, because I like the foods that I eat. And second of all, it makes me feel amazing. So when I got to the resort, because we went to a resort, all inclusive, everything included, the supper menu was not ideal at all. It was really, it was actually kind of bad. In each restaurant, there was maybe one thing that I could have, and there were I'm not, Pat would have to say, but there were like maybe four or five restaurants. I can't remember how many restaurants were on the resort. And then one of them, which had the best possible meal, was actually closed for more than half the time that we were there. So we never got to eat at that restaurant. So the, the meals were not ideal. They were low fat and small portions catering to the idea that most people want to have low fat meals and most people want to have small portions because that's the way most people maintain their weight. That's not how I maintain my weight. So I went to the restaurant for supper on the first day, was disappointed in the meals. And now I was faced with, okay, so this week, what am I going to do? Am I going to eat off plan and eat more, more veg to make up for the fact that the meals were low fat? which would then put me over my carb number? No, that wasn't even an option. What I did was I switched from focusing on supper as my main meal to focus on breakfast as my main meal. So I had a very small supper that night, and then the next morning I ate breakfast. Because guess what? The the place that I was going to, which is very interesting to me, because on the one hand they have these very, very, very small and... and, and um low fat focused suppers, but then you go to breakfast and what do we have? We have bacon, we have sausage, we have eggs. And that's really all I need. And so for, and I mean, there was cheese and there were other meats in the mornings and whatever, but can I just point out that for seven days straight, my main meal was eggs, bacon, sausage. Sometimes I'd have a little bit of some other meat if there was chicken or pork that looked like there wasn't too much uh, veg in it because every, everything had a lot of veg in it, except for the eggs, sausage, and bacon. It was just egg that, so, and the cheese was separated. So I could grab things that made sense to me that would help me to get through what I was trying. Wellness were. I was so clear in my mind of what I was going to eat was going to be within what I always eat was going to be within my keto lifestyle. There was no question in my mind what my plates were going to look like. 
and what my, my, my week was going to look like when it came to food. Now, being able to change from eating suppers to breakfasts, no big deal. I want to tell you, though, and anybody who's in my community knows that I alluded to this, that there was one food, food, I'm calling it food, but you'll see in a minute, one thing that I ended up having that threw me for a loop. And this is where I feel like discipline isn't the problem. It was planning. I know what I eat. So I didn't need discipline for that. I didn't need anything for that. I know what I eat. I put on my plate what I eat. What I hadn't planned for was alcohol. So typically, when Pat and I go on vacation with the kids, they're kids. So really, if there's alcohol happening, it's a decision between myself and Pat. And if I don't feel like drinking, usually on, on vacation, we'll have one day that we drink. But if I don't feel like drinking the other days, then usually Pat and I just choose not to drink because if I'm not drinking, he typically doesn't drink. Well, on our vacation this year, we went with our children who are now adults. I keep calling them children, but they're adults. And when they went to get a drink, they brought us back drinks. And well, I mean, they, they would ask, hey, I'm creating a drink, you want a drink? And like, because I don't see a problem with drinking because I don't normally have a problem with drinking. I said, sure, bring me a drink. So we ended up having one or two drinks each day, which is nowhere near going to put me in a situation where I'm like inebriated or anything. And that wasn't the problem. But what I didn't expect was the huge impact that it was going to have on both of us just having one drink in the day. But it had a huge impact. So what's interesting, Wellness Warrior, is that even though we had an idea and a, a real, like a, a plan for what we would do with food, not having a plan for drinking <laughs> ended up kicking me in the face, right? And with some reflection, what I realized is that it wasn't a case of like, it was more a case of having other people with us that then changed what we were doing in a way that I didn't have a problem with is what caused me my issue. If I thought of myself as not a drinker, I would have said no to the drink. But because I see myself as a drinker, because I drink once or twice a year, the same way that I see myself as keto, because at the minimum once a month, I will have veg. So I see myself as keto, right? I didn't have a problem with saying, yeah, sure, bring me a drink. Now, when it came to how did I feel after a few days and then where I said, okay, now I'm going to drink carbonated water going forward, is that having that drink caused me to not actually end up doing what I wanted to do, right? So if we fail to plan, we're actually planning to fail. And this, again, a hard, a hard realization for me to come to because I really do feel like I'm the kind of person that, that tries to, to do what I'm supposed to do. But it turned out to be a big mistake having, well, having multiple days where I had drinks, right? Because, and it had nothing to do with lacking discipline because when I decided I wasn't doing that anymore, I just stopped. It, it had nothing to do with lacking discipline. I could have not drank the entire vacation and I wouldn't have cared. It had everything to do with the fact that I hadn't previewed. So I didn't know that having one drink each day was going to do this to me because especially, so just for clarity, in the Caribbean or the tropics, I don't know which one it was in, but in the tropics, and I didn't have any fruit. I had three pieces of broccoli while I was there. So no fruit and three pieces of broccoli. And when I say pieces of broccoli, they're talking that was the size of the piece of broccoli. That's all the veg I had. So in my mind, having one drink or two drinks, I didn't see that as a potential big problem, especially the drinks we were having, right? I didn't see that as a potential big problem. Okay. So I'm very diligent about the foods that I eat because I've lived the repercussions of overeating carbs. 
And so therefore I made the decision that I only eat healthy food. But since I've never lived negative repercussions from drinking, or at least I maybe I didn't know that I was living negative repercussions from drinking, because having this happen makes me think maybe that was a contributing factor back in the day where I ate whatever and drank when I went out. And I just didn't know this. I didn't have a reason to have a rule about it. So now <laughs> that's changed. But I need you to know why it changed. The first thing was that my hip came, pain, my hip pain came back. And it took me a little bit. I'm like, oh, my hips bother. And it took me a little bit to figure out, oh my goodness, could it be the drinks that we're having with the kids? Can one drink do that? Apparently it can. <laughs> but, well, one drink over multiple days, right? But more importantly to me, more importantly, my hot flashes came back. And it was hard to figure out that this was happening at first because, again, we're in the tropics. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting overheated. And I only really realized it when it happened to me in the air conditioned room, because prior to that, like I felt a little warm, but we were out at the beach or we were kind of in the pool, but I was like half out the water, half in the water. I'm like, Oh, okay. Get back in the water, whatever. But when we were in the room and it happened, I was just, Oh my goodness. So I'm guessing because drinking would have messed with my hormones, so spiked my insulin, and then all of my hormones, because if my insulin got spiked, then all of my hormones would now be out of um, alignment. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be um, balanced anymore. And I'm overheating again. Well, guess what? <laughs> Lesson learned, right? Lesson learned. Is it going to be hard for me on my next vacation to stick to carbonated water? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Right? Because the issue I lived was that I didn't have a concern about drinking beyond trying not to get drunk or tipsy or whatever. Right? So I thought I didn't have any ideas or any problems or any beliefs that it would bring back my pain or my hot flashes. But now, now that I know this is actually a possibility it's an easy decision wellness warrior it's a simple easy decision i want you to consider that we often have trouble making decisions and sticking to them because we are trying to force ourselves to do something that we actually don't want to do right like when i was trying to give up cashews i kind of didn't really want to get like i like cashews but then can i really say i like it if i was kind of being pulled towards it and so that took forever because i was actually craving them and then like if i went to pets and he had some there i would take a few and then that got me on that track again and then it was back and forth and and i still wanted to eat them and so yeah it was hard but that wasn't it wasn't hard because i didn't have discipline it was hard because i was still addicted and like I needed to be honest with myself that that's what was happening. That if I'm in a situation where I'm having cravings, if I'm in a situation where my 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 brain is trying to push me to go get something, if I'm not being honest with myself that that means I'm out of control, then I'm gonna I'm gonna let myself eat the thing, right? And and then I, or I will need big time hard rules to get myself not to eat the thing rather than figure out the way that I'm doing it that I actually want to do it. So, you know, you want, if you're going to do it, if you're going to do something properly, it should be in your best interest. And so what I realized is that, for example, years ago, I realized I hate going to the gym. But I knew that going to the gym would help my cardiovascular health it would help me to be strong and flexible. And this is something that I do want for my life, but I hate going to the gym. 
And eventually what I realized that I needed to do was find activities that I love to do that gave me a good workout. And that's where rollerblading was the first one I tried because I didn't know how to rollerblade. I knew how to skate, um, roller skate, but I didn't know how to rollerblade. So the process of learning to do it took a lot of energy and effort. And I was, I was diligent in like practicing because I wanted to learn how to do this thing. It was exciting to me to get to be able to, first of all, just move from point A to point B. And then I wanted to learn how to skate backwards. And then I wanted to learn how to do um, spins. And so like the act of learn, again, learning, can I go back to what I said earlier about the fact that we've been brainwashed to believe that we don't like learning, but it's the cornerstone of what pushes us to do things. So anyways. And then roller skating, I sorry, rollerblading became my way of exercising. And I would go out and rollerblade. It was have, and have fun doing it. And I did it a lot. I got a new bike. So then I was rollerblading and cycling. And then I ended up years later buying a longboard because I used to skateboard as a kid. But then I thought, hey, maybe longboarding would be interesting. Now, those are summer activities. In the winter, I learned to ski. And again, that happened when I was in my 20s, my mid-20s. I learned to ski maybe 26. Again, because once, cause the rollerblading happened around that age too. And then I was like, I need something for the winter. Because what was happening is I was rollerblading in the summer and then forcing myself to go to the gym in the winter. Again, discipline, right? And did it work? No. I would start. I would pay the membership. And then after two weeks, I'm paying a membership that I'm not using. And so I decided to find something to do in the winter. And that's when I found skiing. And then eventually skiing turned into snowblading because it's different. And then eventually snowblading turned into snowboarding. Why did I change? Because once I was a good skier and I could do diamonds and I could do, um, I could ski down the hill backwards and I could do spins and uh, I got bored and I, again, I wanted to learn something. So I went to slow snowblading. And then once I was able to do all the same things on those, then I went to um, snowboarding. Right. And I'm assuming that probably when I feel like I've learned all I can learn on snowboarding, I'll probably try to find something. Else. Wellness warrior, do you see where this idea that we need discipline to learn? So for school or we need discipline for work, even it's not reality. It's like I think people need discipline to go to work because you don't like your job. And if you don't like your job, of course, you're not going to want to go to work. I love my job, so I have no problem going to work. As a matter of fact, when I first started my career way back when I used to work on the weekends my choice, no company telling me to do that. My choice. I think that we have been so led to believe that things that are going to be good for us so that provide us income to live our lives have to be negative, that we don't even try to find the positive thing that will help us to do the same. And I want you to move away from that idea. Right? I want you to be honest with yourself if you're actually doing what is in your best interest. Are you doing things because, first of all, you want, but second of all, because it's good for you and it's getting you towards goals you have for yourself? Because if you're not doing what's best for you and that what's getting you towards goals that you have for yourself, you're not going to do them long term, right? Because you want to eat healthy right? You want that healthy food. If you want it, you need to talk to yourself about the benefits of eating that healthy food. That's what's going to help you to do it. You want to get excited about the benefits that you're going to live from eating the healthy food, right? It was excitement about feeling great after I went for a rollerblade or, or, or went skiing because I felt amazing afterwards. And so like the, and I felt amazing while I was doing it. So it's like I had I love doing it. And then I felt great. I felt stronger. I slept better. And then you turn around and I did the same thing with food. I found foods that I liked, right? Because I was. So in all of our lives, we have meats that we're eating or fish or eggs, some kind of protein source. And if you're not eating those things, can I encourage you to try to find some of those things to help yourself to be healthy? Because animals need animal protein to rebuild themselves. So you likely have meat, fish, eggs that you already like in your diet that was standard. And all I did was pull those foods forward into my today. 
And then I added healthy vegetables around them, like at the beginning of my journey. Now, I'm at a stage in my journey right now, Wellness Warrior, where if I have just the healthy meats on my plate in a quantity that I find appropriate, I have no problem. I can eat just those healthy meats. I want you to get excited about what you're eating. I want you to get excited about the healthy outcome you get from eating those foods and then celebrate the benefits that you're living. When you feel amazing, when you're sleeping better, when you're thinking clearly, when your mood is stable, love that part, when your mood is stable, right? When you feel strong and are able to do more activities that you want to do, I want you to celebrate all of these things because that's what's going to help you to realize that the cookie, the chocolate bar, the chips, the garbage isn't giving you what eating healthy is giving you. We have a tendency to ignore the positives that we're getting out of our life and hyper-focus on the negatives. And I want you to reverse that. I want you to hyper-focus on feeling good. I want you to hyper-focus on being free from the lies of the food companies and the pharmaceuticals and all this stuff that's keeping you just giving money to companies rather than giving money to activities that help you to have fun. I have no problem paying for skiing because it helps me to exercise and have fun. I have no problem to pay for climbing because it helps me to exercise and have fun. I don't have a problem buying new boards, whether they're snowboards or or long boards, or I don't have a problem buying things towards doing these activities because they help me to stay healthy. They help me to have fun. I don't have a problem paying more for meat or fish or chicken that's raised better because it helped my body to feel amazing because it's building me with the best quality. I have a problem buying garbage because the only person that benefits are the companies and not me. You're going to be surprised how amazing it feels to do something positive for yourself because you know you will feel amazing afterwards. That is something that I want you to just allow yourself to realize that it's it's better than the taste in your mouth. I know that the whole insulin causing metabolic issues can be complicated, right? I mean, even me, after all this time, did not click in that violet. If you drink a drink every day, <laughs> that you're likely going to like impact your insulin levels. Even after all this time, that idea didn't click into me. I, I don't know how I missed it. So I just put up a video about the impact of zero carb foods on insulin and why we need to be careful about snacking that you can check out. Um, It's in the description right now, and it's going to be linked here when this video is processed, because I think that if I could make that mistake, I think that people who are new to keto and trying to eat healthy might not even understand that fat bombs can cause problems with your insulin. So check that video out. Put it in the comments below. Are you going to today start making decisions towards living the life that lets you do the activities that you want to do? I would love to hear from you. So let's talk about this. The next week, actually, I'm I'm going to be live on Friday. So I will see you then. Have a great rest of your day, Wellness Warriors. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys again next week. Go down in the comments. Let me know what you're up to. Let's talk.